out uh, phantom baskets. That's what I write on my thing. Uh, the, the person that kind of really piqued my interest in this, uh, and I, he's not a personal friend, I don't know him at all, really. I had dinner with him once and didn't even hardly know him at all. But, uh, uh, David Nittman, and he's the one that kind of initiated this, and, and he calls them basket illusions. And what really, got, I got a, a catalog, Packard catalog. I don't know if you get Packard, but it's a good catalog. They have, they have things that Kraft doesn't have and vice versa. Anyways, this thing came in there. I looked at that and I was just stunned. I said, how in the world could you ever do something like that? And I couldn't figure it out. I tried and tried and stumbled around. I did things. I'll pass it around to look at it. And did some things that, that I wasn't uh, happy with, but just kind of fooled with it. And then, and that was just before the uh, AAW convention in Minneapolis, we went down there and had a chance to meet him, and I met, he has a, an assistant who's really good, and uh, during the AAU convention, there was a lot of break time and whatever, and I kept going to his booth, he was never there, but his assistant was there, and full of information, and showing you how to do things, and kind of got me excited about it, and uh, so I kind of took off with this. Now this, I don't, I don't want you to think that this is the only thing I'm ever doing, because I'm doing other things, but I, I, reasons I do this is that uh, I enjoy, first and foremost, I enjoy fooling with the colors. I just like playing with the wood and making uh, different designs and that sort of thing. That's why uh, I do it. The other thing is I think that this kind of project is like Tom, when he does his piercings, there's, there's an eye appeal thing there. It's, di it's different. It's different from what everybody else is doing. He puts something out there that's got color on it and it's got holes in it. It, it draws people in. Uh, the other thing is, and it's a big thing, I think, is you can use wood that nobody else wants. You know, I, I picked up this piece of wood here. This will make a beautiful bowl, hopefully, uh, spalled maple. Uh, but it, because it's, it's spalled, it's got figure to it. What I use is basswood with no knots, no features, maple, no knots, no features, uh, cherry wood, same way, no knots, no features. M the things that most people would find unattractive for, for a turning lend themselves to this, so it's a good way to get rid of the wood. I went over to uh, Bell Hardwoods last week and I wanted some wide pieces. I want to make some more of those platters. And God, they stumbled over it. Oh, I got the scraps here, scraps here. When I got it, I brought a whole truckload of stuff back because they they don't want it. You know, they're they're looking for wood that has grains and, and distinctive figures and that sort of thing. So that's that's another good reason. And being a relatively new uh, turner, one of the things that appeals to me too is if you look at the at the turnings, you don't need a complex turning. It's not a high uh, high diff highly difficult turning, mostly fairly simple. Um, if you have a capture bar and get the bigger stuff, it helps you, but there's nothing there that's really, really difficult to turn. Um, so that's that's the reasoning behind it. Now where, I'll pass this around so you can look at it. Oops, not that one. This one. Where I get my inspiration, I'm not a real original thinker all the time come up with designs. If you go on the internet and Google search Native American baskets, uh, Afri African American vessels or baskets, or not African American, African, uh, you can get a ton, there's, there's thousands and thousands of pictures. There's some, some that I've printed off there just to, to get you started. Some of those I've, I've used as inspiration for some of the things in the back table there. Jim, does Nittman yes. have a website? Nittman, David Nittman has a good website. It'll blow you away. You look at the stuff he does, and it's just, it's inspiring, but it's scary because his, his turnings are complex. Although I didn't know it at the time, he does a lot of flat work, like those, those platters. He does a ton of them. And, and once I did some, I figured out, I know why he does those, because they're real simple to do. But he, he's an amazing artist. His standard fee is ten thousand dollars. If you want to buy a Nitman turning, you you got to have ten grand in your pocket. And when we had dinner with him that night at the convention, he said he's he is uh, almost exhausted. He can't keep up with his demand. 
<laughs> That's tough. What's that? Is it just under D? Dave, yeah, just Google search David Nitman. It's N I T T M A N. And he's got a gallery in there. Uh, and when I, and he, uh, he's very fond of his uh, things he had. Uh, I'll show you a bunch of uh, tools that I use and have kind of come down to for cutting these beads. He had a tool for cutting beads and, it, and he hand carves the handles so they don't turn. They're really neat. And uh, I picked one up. I was looking at it. My wife was with me says, why don't you just buy it? And you went to mess around and make one. I said, okay. How much is that? $200. You got it, didn't you? Huh? You no, I said it back. <laughs> um, so what, and what I, I guess if I could convince you to do anything. You want to start out on this. There's some tools you're going to need. You know, get to this again. The number one thing you need, I mean, most, most of us have something around the shop that we can modify and cut the beads with. What you don't have, a lot of people don't have, is a wood burner. And if you look in that Packard catalog, they have several models of wood burners. This one is a really good one. Netman uses a different one. And they're about a $100 item, you know, give or take a couple bucks. And once you have that, uh, You'll find, and I'll, I'll go through this a little bit more, but I make my own bits. If you buy a, a burning tip, a burning tip like that is anywhere from $25 to $35. And I've got a whole bushel of them. What are you making them out of? And what I do is I've, I've got a booklet here, and I'll pass it around, and you can copy it if you want. It's from Molly Winton. Ma, I met her at, at uh, talked to her at length. And she said, you're crazy doing all that. He said, if, she said, if you're doing Nitman stuff or you want to do his stuff, make your own. So I bought Necron wire, uh, about $7 a, a coil. Lawrence just bought some. Uh, and each coil you could probably make two, 300 of these and it cost me about a nickel a piece. So with some, some parts I bought from Radio Shack in the jack that fits your burner, uh, I can change bits and it cost me about a nickel. So, and these, these are real easy to make, super easy. Nothing to it. If you look in that book there, I'll tell you how to do it. So those commercial first. ones also burn out too. So you're 35 bucks. Right. You're 30, you, won't, you won't get any longer life out of this than you will out of that. Yeah. And when it burns out, this goes in the trash. Now, did you harden that? No. See, when I took that thing with Ben Poe, he takes and cranks it up until it gets cherry yeah. red. Yeah, cherry red. It's cherry yeah. red. And, then, and supposedly that hardens. Yeah. And, and, so do you do that? I do that, oh, yes. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, fact, doesn't dip it or anything? It just no. Makes it cherry just red. make it cherry red and back. But I, I alter them, and, I, and I'll get to that later, but I, I uh, paint them flat and then grind shapes on them. Yeah. So. so the first thing you got to do is turn the, board. turn the light. I'm going to skip uh, what can be the maybe the most exciting part of this is watching me turn a bowl sometimes. I pre-turned this yesterday, and normally what I do, and I do it, I don't care if it's this size bowl, or a platter, or this size, uh, I turn it and turn the beads the same day, because you talk about no matter what you do when you turn something, it gets a little bit of a out of round situation, and cutting the, the uh, beads in there when it's out of round causes things hap to happen that you're not going to like. Uh, it, it just it doesn't work well. So normally what I would do is with a bowl like this is cut the outside shape Then cut the beads in and Sand them do everything I want and then go to the inside and do the same thing and I'd cut the and I'd leave the inside in for stability and, and, and it's that critical and then I've got the outside cut then I'll turn around and cut the inside out touch the sander to it and then come in and cut the beads on the inside now this I cut yesterday and hopefully it hasn't, uh, it looks like it's fairly good as far as staying round. Uh, this is, this is uh, maple. Uh, I, Nitman uses, if you look in uh, some of the stuff that, uh, well on his website, he uses a lot of basswood. He also uses holly, cherry, and maple. I've tried basswood and I, I just, I don't like it. It's too soft, it tends to tear. Now what I'm going to do, I uh, brought one of these to the bring back, it's, it's like a spear point three ways. It's actually a three-sided skew and I use it constantly. I, I use this for everything I do. Uh, 
if I'm cutting beads or all that sort of thing, and, and I shouldn't say this, but it rarely, if ever, catches. And it doesn't just uh, scrape, it actually will cut a, cut a small. And you don't want to use anything but a, a scraper type, a skew or something on the, on the outside edge. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut the speed now. I like to keep the speed fairly low. I do three beads at a time, and I don't I don't know why. If you do four or five beads, you lay them out on here. By the time you get to the last one, it won't be <laughs> you. It won't be right. It just doesn't hold. I bought this this cutter because it was the closest one. I bought this from Craft Supply, and it's got a round groove. Three, I'm using three sixteenths uh, beads, and you, and you can adjust that. Three sixteenths works good, or quarter. This this bead cutter is designed to be used handled down, running the points into the wood. That's what they tell you in the instructions. What they don't tell you is that that's designed for a round cylinder that's straight. When you get to a curved surface, you always got to remember that one side of this is turning at a different speed than the other, and it wants to pull this like this and make big gouges in your wood. So on a project like this, with any of the any of the turners that I do, you don't want to dress the wood this way. You want to go this way, and I turn this. This is the only thing I use this particular one for is to mark mark my spacings, and it does a pretty good job doing that. That's the only thing I use. I, I will make beads on this on a, on a cylinder, a spindle cylinder that's straight. Other than that, I don't use it. I'm just, I'm just doing this as a marker. So there I've got three beads marked out. I'll go back to my spear point skew, and I want to push that in the depth of that bead. Slow everything you do carefully. You notice I'm not, on any of these, I'm not doing this very much. Because if you do, it wants to pull the tool. It just, it just wants to pull it down there and you'll have grooves in there. Okay, now... This, this tool, I'll sh these will be up here and you can look at them. This, this, if that looks like a, the shaft to a craftsman screwdriver, there's a reason for that. That's what it is. I cut it off. And what I've actually done is made a point, and it's got a radius on either side of that point. And I don't know if you can see that better here. Um, but it's got a point, and it's got a radius on either side. And then what I do is take a, a diamond round file, like a rat tail file, and file up like this to sharpen it and that leaves the radius in there and it also leaves a little burr you can feel on top and I'm going to dress the wood with it down if you address the wood with it up you gotta get another piece of wood it doesn't work and this I just move slightly cuts the corners off. And, and by the way, if you're a, a, you're a, a computer user and you know what uh, YouTube is, there are demos on YouTube of guys yeah, showing you how to do this very same thing using a variety of different tools and that sort of thing. This tool is the one I use for cleanup and all I do is, is form the bead to the shape of this. This is from Robert Sorby. It, you can find it in any of the magazines, a 3 16 bead cutter. And I also, will sharp, when I sharpen that, it's got a radius in here. And I sharpen that the same way, upwards, 
like this and it leaves a slight burr on there and that's actually what I'm going to cut with. Now Sorby, I, I really like it, the, the tool. I can't use it on the inside and we'll get to that because there's not enough tool there and, and the inside wants to pull you in. But I use this on the outside. Um, a Sorby tool, if you go to Craft, and I think they've got them in Packer, I don't remember, they're about a $50 item. I went online and just typed in, uh, did a Google search, Robert Sorby 316 bead, I got it for 20 bucks. Same thing. Comes with absolutely no instructions. You get a tool wrapped in a plastic thing. So you got to figure it out yourself. And that's, I showed you what I do. Now I'm going to hit this very carefully. All I want to do is just I just cut it till I see wood coming off the back end of that uh, radius. And you want to have the tool as you're going around, you want to have it at as approximate as you can, as close as you can to a 90 degree angle. So if this were a round sphere, that it would go through the center. You don't want to have it cutting this way into something that's curved this way. And the key to this is easy. It's one of the other reasons I told you I don't, I leave the inside there and I leave it solid because every now and then, as easy as I want to do it, it goes like this, so I have to take the gouge and recut it. And it gives me the wood there to do it with. Okay. I'm going to mark three more. Oh, see there. Ah. There we go. I didn't have that at the right angle. That'll all cut out of there, though. I bought this, yeah, I, this has got a radius ground rate in it, you see it. I bought that from Kraft Supply. That's the spear point, now I'll take the uh, Tool with the point and the radius shoulders. Now we'll clean it up with a sorby. At this point, uh, with this bowl, I'm going to do the inside here, just show you how that's done. But at this point, I'm not going to go back here anymore because I don't have the room. And what, I would, what I'm going to do is I'll cut the inside and then I would take a jam chuck and cut the end off, you know, reverse the bowl and then finish the beads all the way to the uh, glue, uh, glue block. And I actually leave the, a little bit of the glue block uh, showing. I think you can like that, something like that but I, I'll use a jam chuck, so I'm going to move a little bit. But one of the things you want to do with this, if you're going to put color on, you need to, you need to provide a, a shadow, a dark shadow, this way and this way, so that defines your spaces that you're going to paint. And the other reason you do it, I use pens, and it doesn't matter if you use pens, acrylic paint, whatever, you know, paint, any of those will migrate, but if you burn in, lines it stops it so you're just so the color stays on the on the uh, square where you want it there's a couple ways to burn in 
these lines. Somebody mentioned wires. Wires work good when you're fairly straight this way. They don't work at all when you get into a curved situation. And I do two things. One, I bought a, at a surplus store, I bought some really stiff belt. I, I don't know, probably got five, six hundred feet of it. And it's 120 grit. It's got a stiff. This is the way Nitman says to do it. And it, it helps if you've got a variable speed uh, machine. But he uses the edge of the sandpaper, and you get two results from this. One, it kind of sands that edge as you go. You see, I don't know if you can see that, but you come down through there, hold the edge of that. I have been doing that, and I've kind of switched. I use a, a plastic laminate tabletop scraps. I, I like it better, actually. I've been doing this last little bit. It burns a little deeper, burns a little quicker. And you see it actually radiuses to the piece you're, you're burning. And I'm bending that to conform to the radius as I go. Just the heat from that alone, I see it's got wobbling a little bit. Hopefully, I can get the inside done. Hey, how you gonna do the inside? Well, I'm just gonna turn this and work from here. One of, one of the things that the new lathe that I bought that uh, I really like is I can pull the headstock and stand on the end of the lathe. But I'll do this this way. And I'm gonna I'm gonna work from this. One of the things I didn't mention, I just thought of, when you're cutting these beads, and you'll see this if you watch on YouTube, you want to cut approximately at center, you know, pretty close to center. If you get it up at all, it'll give you problems. The uh, inside, for some reason, that the uh, inside curvature exacerbates the problem of different speeds on the tool. It wants to yank your tool or flip your tool sideways real bad. So what I what I did, and I just lucked into this. I, I made my own tool up, and a, a, if you get a chance to look at this, I carved uh, with a uh, chainsaw sharpener, a three sixteenths chainsaw. Um, you know, the little thing you use for sharpening chainsaws, a little grinder, and I put a three sixteenths radius in it, and then I radius both sides of it this way. But it's got a fairly wide, it's a half inch wide flat, and this is the only thing I'll use on the inside of anything. Uh, because everything, this sorby that I like so well, if you put sorby on the inside, it, it, it immediately grabs it and goes that way. And it's something you have to play with and learn how to do it. But I put a negative, negative grind down here so you really get a sharp angle scrape. Um, and then you sharpen this the same way, put in a burr on top. So you're cutting with that burr. And I, I do the outside edge with the uh, with my spear point. I can't see that. There we go. Next, I'm going to mark spaces. Take my spear point, open them up a little bit more. Screwdriver and put a radius in them. Remember, and always a downward attitude. Put 
works out with the homemade bead cutter. I'm bending this with my thumb so it kind of conforms to the angle. I ought to use a point. What is that that you're This is a uh, plastic laminate from ICA. Some scrap pieces of it. Sandpaper, you're welcome to. Uh, but the from ICA, I think, works the best from what I've seen. As far as sanding, I don't want to waste your time here doing that, but I'll just show you real quickly how what I do for sanding. Uh, <coughs> I don't use that uh, mesh, what we call a braid net, because there's enough fuzzy stuff in there, it grabs it out of your hand. Uh, what, what, what I will do is just come along and this is 120 grit. Yeah, I go into each groove and I kind of let it puff over onto the side here a little bit. You know, what I do on my lathe, I can reverse it and I found it's really valuable is I'll stop it, reverse it, sand the other way. And then the thing that uh, helps me the most is I use uh, steel wool, just four out steel wool. And it goes almost right down in those grooves. That's how I cut them. And you can see that's got a little wobble just the heat from working on it. And normally I would do a little bit better job of uh, sanding on that than what I did there. But, um,
Okay. okay, this is a three-point skew. Uh, use it for starting the beads. Also use it for making beads. Uh, anything you can use the skew for, but it, it doesn't grab. It doesn't kick like a regular skew can. And it has a semi tool. And it's used on a cylinder with a handle down presentation. That does not work when you're cutting on a faceplate. You need to, uh, if you're going to use it to cut, you use it with the groove up and with the handle up. I use it this way just as a marker, as a spacing marker, because it doesn't bite, it doesn't uh, bind and travel. And this is available from Craft Supply. This tool here is uh, made from a uh, piece of uh, hardened steel, handmade. It's got a point with a radius on either side of the point, the radius is a 3 16th radius. And I use that uh, to start rolling the bead. My finishing tool is from Robert Sorby, and it's a, a 3 16th radius tool. And you use this just as a finisher. You don't try to cut the whole bead with it. It'll tear it apart. You just use this to take the edges down so it's uniform. One other tool on the inside of the bowl, uh, there's a lot of uh, pressures brought to bay, bear. This is a homemade tool, works really good on the inside. It's a piece of half inch flat stock with an old skew, reground to a 3 16 radius. 3 16 inside and outside. And it's got a negative grind in the top so it does not grab. It's just strictly a scraper. I like, I like to uh, actually, it burns a little easier without a finish on them, but I like to finish them. Like this one I, I did yesterday, and what I did is put uh, Danish oil. I like Danish oil a lot because it accepts lacquer, and you can paint over it, and it doesn't interfere. So I leave this on the lathe, something like this, pour Danish oil in it, turn the lathe on, and it'll actually come right through. It's amazing. So you would saturate it with Danish oil. Uh, on something like this, normally what I would do is is put apply oil while it's on the lathe because you can burn through that oil. It doesn't doesn't bother it at all. Um, I'd have an oil finish on that, and then I'd decide what I want to do pattern wise. Jim, how yes. long do you let the oil set before you can paint over it? Uh, just overnight. That's all I do. It so it seems to harden up. You don't use tongue oil at all. No. Tongue oil takes longer to dry for some reason. And it's not, tongue oil doesn't wick out. I mean, I, I pour that to Danish oil in here, turn the lathe on, and I gotta have a cloth over it immediately. And the sides aren't real thin. The sides on this are three-eighths of an inch. Except for right here, I didn't have a cutter long enough to get in there. So I got some, some weight in there. But, uh, but yeah, and Danish oil, and tongue oil too, is, is also compatible with lacquer. So that's what I use. Now, at this point, I brought these two things along. This, this is a six-point design, and this is an eight-point. And the only, the only difference is this is every 60 degrees, and this is every 45. You got a point, so you end up with eight. And the whole trick to this, if you've had uh, Geometry 101, you know you got 360 degrees to work with. And I put some sticky stuff on that, it's really working good. Um, now, this is my, what I call a master board. Every circle on there is, is a bowl that I've made. Um, and I, I use five degrees. A Nitman, uh, what does he recommend? I, th I think he said 10 degrees, but 10 degrees would be too wide, I think. It makes a big groove. And I, and I look at his stuff and I, I He's saying 10 degrees, but he, he's using 5 degrees. I know he is. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, 10 I mean, 10 degrees, you'd have big big wedges so this wide. And I, I've got photos and look close up at his stuff at his work, and I know what he does. So the first thing you do is take a protractor, and hopefully a good one that's, get, that's fairly accurate. And I do a straight line across, and I set my protractor on there, set up my degrees, and run a ruler through there until I get 360 degrees, five degrees apart all the way around there. 
So if I can get those lines under here, I know I, I've got something that when I mark it out, go around, I like geometric designs, then I know it's going to be accurate. Um, I'll show you this quickly. Is this, this is fairly simple, what I'm going to show you. That's easy. You set it on there. You get it lined up in the center. I'll show you how to do that. And it's pretty easy. You just draw lines on there. This one, on the other hand, this is probably the most radical shape I've done. How do you, these lines, you got 360 degrees here, and here, and here. And they're all different widths. And I'm batting, you know, I'm sitting there yesterday trying to figure out how to do it. My wife says, well, I've got some stuff you spray on when I make quilts and it sticks cloth together. And if you sprayed that on this, it wouldn't move. So, giving credit where credit is due, I drew a circle on there, the same diameter as this. And you can see it on there. And I centered this up here. And I'm carrying under there. And she said, well, I can see that better than you can. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, go ahead, take a pencil and mark that all the way around. And once I put it on there, it was fresh, it went like that. It, it could pick the thing up and this would come with it. But it wasn't glued, it was just sticky. So she marked those lines around there. I took a right angle and went to every one of her marks, which extends out here, and this isn't lined up right, but, and just made a mark here. Just made a short mark here. Then, uh, and there's a lot of ways you can do these. I, I went to the dollar store, bought a couple of these when Isn't school was rubber? starting. Yeah, it's plastic or something. And you oh. can go from this mark here, and I made a dot here in the center with a pencil, I'll sand it out, and you can do this. Just come from both sides. Then. Yeah, well, or just do ends, one. Yeah, and I, I draw a line here and stop there, and then move over to the next there. mark here, run this through the center. Fairly easy. Um, the only problem with this is you got to keep bending it and holding it around there. So I've got bandsaw blades which break every now and then. And so I just take a bandsaw blade and just run the teeth through the grinder. And, find, and I can bend this, you know, shape it. These have been on dozens of these. And I like to use this a little bit better and I line this up with a mark. Hold it there. And then just go over to the next one. And do the same thing. <clears throat> um, you're smarter than you look, you know. <laughs> almost have to be, right? Yeah. And then on the top here, I just had to make a different shape. I got marks up here, so I made this shape that fits around there. So all I had to do there is go around on the other side and uh, line that up. And what I, what I do it, too is, is in the evenings I come in and, and watch some TV or football games on or something. I'm just sitting there at the table just messing with this. and I don't use my good hunting, fishing, turning time to, to do this. That's when I do it in the evenings. And, uh, but that's how you do a really extreme shape. And the other thing, I, I, I've been talking to Steve Promo, and he wants to make some of these. Now his idea, and I think Nittman does this, is you get a, a, a wheel, a wooden, a wooden or metal wheel, indexing wheel. You put it on the end of the lathe, you have this here, and you make a piece to fit on your on your tool rest that's contoured to shape this, and then you turn it five degrees. That's another way of doing it, but this was a little more involved in what I wanted to get into. And for most of the stuff I've made, I don't I don't need it. You just I have a, I have a mental problem for you. Okay. These are simulated bead beadwork. Mm -hmm. What it looks like. Right. Try to figure out how to do this where the beads are the same length because I have never known beadwork people to choose different size beads in their work. They're about the same diameter, but they're the same length. They're, these, these are simulating a, a sweet grass. The Indians, would, they're oh. not beads. So yeah. and they wind it around and then they weave stuff through it. Right. And, and they have uh, those, those vertical ties is what this is simulating. Yeah, beads, you're right, it wouldn't. And the, the, and the, ties the, would the only thing that's different, and you look in those uh, pieces that I showed you there, uh, when somebody's weaving something, uh, it's, it's a spiral. Mm -hmm. So it tends, it's really hard to, they'll be off a little bit, where you can be right on the money with this. <laughs> now, the other thing, going back to my wife again, you wonder, well, how's, 
how is that pattern going to look? If you look at that one small sheet back there, there's a butterfly. Linda loves uh, technology and cameras and so on. So she took a picture of the of that flat bowl, and I drew the butterfly outline. I need one side because they're both the same, and I knew what to do. Uh, one of them back there has got a turtle on the side, and I didn't know for sure how I wanted to do that, so I drew a turtle on there. Uh, that's the same thing, both of them on there. That's um, this one. Uh, this one here, the one, and I'll show you a little bit on coloring it. And I wanted to see different colors and see how they look. She took a picture of it. I colored it on there and said, oh, I don't like that one. I don't like how that looks. So that's what I'm going to do with that one. Um, I told you that the flat work back there, those platters, are easy, easier. The reason is you can make a wheel like I've got here, a degree wheel, cut it out, set it, and center it right in the platter, tape it on, and you can run a ruler all the way across so you can do twice as many. And those go on really, really fast. Um, and that's a way to make, make a shape fast. Um, that one, uh, one platter back there that has a turtle in the center and some, and some designs around the side, that's it right there. The uh, one you were asking me about with the feathers, there's the feather right after I cut it, burned it in, and I actually have the spiral designs in there. It just, it just makes it easier. It's just an easier way to do it until when you go to putting your design on the wood, you know what you're doing. Saves you a lot of scrap, huh? Yeah, it saves you a lot. Well, what happens, you know, I make mistakes with this and put it on the wrong square every now and then. you got to take a knife and scrape it off, and it's, it's a pain. I don't like doing that. Okay, I've got my, where to go? My piece off the lathe, and I, I want to put my vertical lines on there. How do I do it? Well, the first thing I do is draw a circle on my 360 degree piece, and I want to make the circle the same size or maybe just a little bit larger as the uh, turning. We'll see how that looks. Set that on there, it's too bad. It's all right. Right there, should about do it. What's the copper wire for on your, on your protractor? To hold it together. It's one of those high tech. <laughs> it keeps popping out of here. I'm low budget, you know. Just uh, shoot. Where does it, you see a pencil? <laughs> okay, what I do now? I've got a, I've got that thing centered, and I've marked on there. I don't know if you can see it. I've got X's on my 90 degrees. So I'll line up, and I, I did this once when Lawrence visited. So I've got some lines on there already, uh, and I'll line those lines up. My marks up. So I'll put one here. So that way if I move this, which I often do accidentally, I can realign it. So all I've got to do now is go around here and I mark every five degrees. Not hard to do. Zip it around. The other thing is, I'll come up here in the middle of the, and you want to be fairly accurate on this, I had it marked already. On the top here, make a mark. So now I'm making lines up to there. And I won't do a ton of these, but just to give you an idea how, how they're done. Um, this is a hacksaw blade. You get cheap hacksaw blades. Uh, they work pretty well, too. I have done it the wrong way. Let's do this one. I could probably do that with a plastic ruler, too. Line it up with the center, and there, center's lined up, center's lined up,
Okay, and I just do that all the way around. What I like to do too to keep everything e equal is I start from all four sides and I'll and work this way. And if you start on this end and go around this way, something will be screwed up every time. So you start from four points or six points and work out. That's why you can see what I did on here because of the complexity of the angles. Is I actually did, you can see the marks I made in here. Um, and I made one down the middle and I'm working out from those to keep, keep everything uniform. Um, then you get to the point where you really have to have a burner, something. And Nittman's got one that he recommends, it's in Packard. Uh, burn masters are, I think, are real good. They're around 100 bucks. Now this is a double port, means I can put two burners on there, and it costs more to get one of those. Uh, and I, for the life of me, I don't know why you'd need it, because it's not hard to switch burners, you just pull them out. I just bought, I think it's called a razor. Yeah, those are good ones too. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're most of the commercially made ones you see are, are good. And if you look in Molly Winton's book, she's got a, uh, directions on there on how to, how to make these tips, how to make the hand pieces. And you can make them different shapes. She has one that's called a basket weave. And all I did with that is I wound a bunch of nichrome around a, around a screwdriver or something round. I don't remember what it was. And these are kind of neat because you can go this way and then you turn this way. And it looks like a basket weave. But it's a lot of burning, and if you're holding it this way, your, your hands get fatigued. So I made a handle, and she showed me this, it wasn't my idea, how to do it this way, and it's a whole lot easier. And, and you can do that very accurately, just using those. And like I say, I, you know, this is, these tips cost me a nickel. That's, that's all it is. Um, is there a brown or a black Which? small bag over there? Yeah, that one, where, where right there. The, where do you buy the nickel wire? I bought it online. Ask Lawrence make sh and ask him what website he used and don't get it from them. Mine was on Christmas. That was what, about six weeks after I visited? Oh, those those there, are the different tips that I've made yeah. so far for different things that I've used. He sells... You can, you can make a tip just about anything you want. Uh, let me I'll pass one around here. Here's one that's about the same as what I'm using right now. That's what I'm using. You want to pass that around? You can look at it. I've used it a lot, but it's a little thinner wire. And I like the one I'm using because I'm using an uh, 18 gauge. And you can press on it a little harder. He, um, the kit includes 10 feet of 22, I think it was 22 gauge. Yeah, you get 22, 20, and 18. Yeah, of a 10 feet, 3 feet, and 2 yeah. feet. And you just clip off a piece, and what I, what I do to make the one that I'm using right now, I'll start one and show you how that works. I'll just push it out there. Um, what I do on the, the burner that I'm going to show you how to use, I take a pair of needle nose and grip it tightly. And I know I've got enough extra wire here to plug into the burner. Okay, and then I'll clip that off. I've got an anvil, but you piece of a piece of metal, anything you can pound on. I set that on that, and with a ball peen hammer, and beat it flat. Mm -hmm. Then take a grinder and grind in a real <laughs> shallow angle. If you try to grind an angle in that fits exactly to that groove, it'll drive you nuts. It'll take you forever. It's hard to use. Uh, and then the other thing that I learned, and, and Nitman also sells these, and they're about fifty bucks a piece. Uh, he makes his money. Uh, you put it on an angle, if you're right-handed, you, because otherwise if they're straight, they're, they're hard. But if you have them on an angle like that, um, let me just go through. And, and when I'm done with that and I've got it ground out to the shape that I want, I put it in the machine, I turn the machine up till it's bright red, and then turn it off and that tempers it. Um, and I haven't burned one of these out yet. They, they last a long time. But, uh, and they'll cost as minimal. <laughs> Once you make your investment, you buy your burner. And then, you can just air cool it. You don't quench it. Yeah, you don't quench it. Just air cool it. And tell it that, that pamphlet from uh, Molly Winton, which is going around, is very informative on how to do those sorts of things. So, in this burner, like I say, and I don't know if you, you can see it, uh, it, it will, uh, when, I, when I do that basket weave, there's a lot of uh, metal there. And you can see it's starting to glow a little bit like, like that. And I don't want to burn it that much right now. What, you, what setting do you set that up? I'm setting that at five or six. I don't, I don't know what that means, you know. You just, you just play with it. And then you use it. 
Now, the important thing is when, you, when you're using this, you want a real shallow radius again, and you roll it. You start and you roll it, and you actually touch the beads in front and back every time. Touch front, back, front, back. And I'll, I'll burn a couple here to start there. And you see I got a little gap in the groove there, if you can see that. So I roll it. And I roll it. Roll it. I'll sit there at night with this thing in my lap on the lazy boy, supposedly watching something my wife likes. <laughs> yeah, that's what we all do. She wants you to watch it, brother. Yeah. She has to remove it. That kind of gives you that. And on the, in the inside, it's fairly easy to, to lay those out because you're going to the center point in there. You can see it. So you just lay your, your piece in there like this. And you roll your uh, you roll your marks around, and uh, like from here, I roll that around to the inside. And so then, when I do the inside, uh, I'll lay it out this way. Go through the center point and up to that point, and draw a line with my pencil and then burn them in. So that's that's really all that's involved on that. Okay. Now, have you played around with um, maybe putting your lateral lines at an angle? Oh, these here, you mean? Yeah. yeah. I haven't. Uh, Nitman does that a little bit, but you could do it. There's no reason not to. Just it adds an extra complexity in there as well. Yeah, there's no reason not to. As long as you keep using it. Yeah. yeah. Um, my grooves are done. I got sanded. I got a nice, nice coat of uh, Danish oil on there. It's dried, hardened, everything. Now I want to put a pattern on there, and that's where go back to those pictures that I showed you. I I like to do a practice on a, on a picture. I don't think you have to, uh, but it really helps if you do. Gary asked, "How do you get those those curved shapes in there?" And actually. Those are those are uh, straight. What I did is I, I made I go around and I make my marks. I decide if I want whatever you want, but I want a forty. This one here is a forty-five degree or an eight-point. So I go around and, and uh, I do have some kind of pattern on the outside. I don't like to paint that because it can rub off and it gives it a little extra thing for to, to look at. So I go around here. And I'll mark eight points, and I just put a dot. And when I when I lay these out, I just use a dot in case I got to move something. I don't want them full of paint, so I'll go around and make those dots. Now, that's actually then what I did to make those is from my 45 degree marks from each eight point, I moved it over and down, over and down, over and down, and because it's not a parallel line because it shrinks, it makes it look like it's curved. Well, it is curved but you don't have to do anything special to make them curve. It's from this point, I go over one, down one. And from that one, over one, down one. Uh, and you can alter that by going over two, down, and down one. It, there's just different things you can play so with. So you're just there. using the, the, the cross hatch. Right. You're just, you're just using the bowl. And, and as you go, this line will come through. And when you put the next point down through there, it intersects it, and you end up with three different size uh, ovals in there, let's say. So that's your design. And then and then I do is, is switch around and, I, and you can see I've got the outside marked here. And I can do the same thing on the outside and it'll look very similar. Uh, it'd be something like this right here. This, I've got eight points on the inside, eight points on the outside. Um, what I use, and this again you get a there's a learning curve there too. You can spend a lot of money, uh, and I did a couple times, or you can improvise and come out of it pretty, pretty easy. I went to uh, Michael's, I think it was, one of those craft stores someplace, and I think there's one in, uh, there's a craft place in Gaylord, uh, there's one in uh, Hobby Lobby, Hobby Lobby in Gaylord. Hobby Lobby in Gaylord. 
Marquette. There's Marquette's got uh, Michael's. Mike. There's something you go downstate. And, now, and this is a good. Joanne's in the suit. Joanne, but they don't. Joanne's won't have the high end stuff. No, no. But I do. I've got a lot of stuff in here I bought from Joanne's. I'll show you that. The high end pins are very fine, and they're also very flexible on the end, and they can go down and groove. But these are these are pricey. And this this set right here was about twenty five thirty bucks for this. Um, these are the best. I mean, and you can paint with them, and it's just super. What's that? Are they felt tips? Yeah, they're felt tips here. Very fine. They're very fine and they work nice. That's that's second tier. The best you can get that I found is uh, Faber Castell. And Michael's carries these. This set right here is a hundred bucks. I bought it online for fifty. But uh, <laughs> you know, I just just uh, word searched it, and these are these are beautiful. But they're also you know there's there's a lot of money there. How um, long will that set last? I don't know. Oh. I went to, uh, I think it was Hobby Lobby there at Gaylor we stopped. That's a set, and this, this is archival ink, permanent, just like the other stuff, buck and a half. Really? Buck and a half for that set. <laughs> now, the tips, as you can see, they're very fine. The difference is those tips are stiff on the board. So it's hard to move them around sometimes. And what I do is match colors, and I use the pricey ones to go down in between a little bit and around, and then on the outside, I use the same pen, same color, and use these for a buck and a half. Yeah, and it gets, oh, there's another. Somebody asked about how'd you get that feather. There's my pattern. I forgot that was in there. The other thing that I do a lot of is that when you use, uh, when you use the thicker tips, you, uh, especially white, I, I'll talk about white in a second, it's a whole different deal. I, I use a razor blade and actually trim them a little bit finer, and you can do that. It doesn't seem to hurt them at all. Uh, these right here, permanent markers, fine tip, and they're a little bulky. I just take the razor blade and trim them. Dollar store, you get a whole set for a dollar. They're permanent and they work really well. So that's another way to go. You have a um, It's a place in Houghton Lake, you're going down. Down state, Houghton Lake's got a place called Arnie's, and they sell tons of this stuff. It's the biggest art supply place I know of in the state. And I'll go in there and they have individual pens, uh, and these are Faber Castile pens. Those are sell for about five bucks, and I bought this one for a buck and a half. You know, just I just if he's got stuff on sale, I'm going through there. I'll grab it. So. And what kind of ink is that? Oh, well, they call it archival ink, which means it won't fade. Uh, you can. Supposedly set it in the sunlight and all. Now the problem you got, these are mostly all an alcohol based pen, um, which means a real thin film that goes on. Light colors don't work. You cannot put white on out of any of these sets, it just won't show. Yellow doesn't work either, uh, it doesn't show up. Uh, so you got a problem because white, and this is my own informal research, if you put something, a white pattern on something, when somebody comes up and looks at something, that's the first thing they grab and they, they link them. They link something with white. And so you've got it, in order to get white on there, you got to have something opaque. And that's hard. Um, somebody mentioned, I think Hank mentioned Joann's. You go into Joann's Fabric, last time I was in there, I bought all they had. And these things called gel pens, you know, like a, they're like a regular pen. Only uh, if you are real, you can't press on them. But if you don't press on them much, they will put up. Uh, you can write with white; it's opaque, uh, and it takes you forever and a day sometimes to to cover a square. But it it works, and it doesn't uh, seem to be affected by the lacquer and that sort of thing. So that's one way to go. Well, that's time consuming. Yeah, way around. There's also Sharpies, and these, you got to be careful to dry out. Now this one, you can see the wedge on there. This used to be round and kind of stubby on the end, and I cut that with a razor blade. And these work fairly well. If you keep the cap on them, if you don't keep the cap on them all the time, they dry out. When you shake these up, and these actually have an oil paint, and they, uh, they go on pretty nice. Where would you find those? Just any place that's got pens and 
school supplies, and you got to push on a little bit. Paint yeah, it's actually a paint. Yeah, can you can you remind me? The other thing that I do is uh, in, India ink. You shake it up good. I go over it with a a gel pen, block my white in, then take a little bitty brush, and it goes real fast. Take a fine brush, dip it in India ink. India ink is opaque, and it stays put. Doesn't move, and it's a good way to put on weight. You can put it on, you know, pre pretty dug on fast. But see, you can you can go along with a brush and put. Ah, the ladies of the east. The decoration I can do. And then once you put a base in, then you go over it with the with the India ink, and it does a good job. The other the other thing is when you put your colors on, the first coat of lacquer tends to. Thin a little bit, you have to go back over, but uh, when you go back over it, uh, it goes on real fast, so it's not hard to do. Um, Let me see, you cover these up with lacquer afterwards? Then? Yeah, in fact, what I do, uh, I'll put a color on, one color at a time, and as soon as I put, let's say, black on or white or pick the, pick the color, I spray it with a thin coat of lacquer. Satin? That box oh, is satin, satin lacquer. Okay. Uh, here's one kind. Any, don't use gloss, gloss just it doesn't work. But clear satin, any really is just clear lacquer satin. What uh, the gloss one? It's it's shiny. You don't it 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 isn't good. You so you like take it. you put on a color and then you lacquer. Right. Put another color. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> I'm a black man, so I'm painting on that shiny surface. No, well, you the certain you, yeah, and then you're, he's right because that's the other thing. If you use a gloss, then the paint of the Paint doesn't want to stick to it, so. Yeah. Um, but that's about it. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs>